So uh, without taking up too much of the precious 30 minutes, uh, just very happy to um, introduce Lauren. Lauren's title is Online and Hybrid Instruction for Computer Science Classrooms. She comes to us all the way from Georgia State University and her research interests are in education technology and online learning, particularly in computing education. And she's basically written some cracking papers that we, um, we, we've all read at Raspberry Pi. And we're just absolutely delighted, Lauren, for you to um, be able to come and speak to us today. So over to you. Thank you very much. All right. So as Sue mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Learning Sciences at Georgia State. I'm in the program for learning technologies or educational technology. And oftentimes people have the misconception that that means that I want to replace teachers with technology, which is absolutely not what I see the role of technology in classrooms being. I treat technology like a lot of other professions treat technology. I want it to replace the boring, tedious things that none of us really like to do and that technology can do better so that we can focus more on the creative aspect, the connection with students that we all enjoy a bit more and is, you know, more fulfilling for us. So today I'm going to talk about both online and hybrid learning. Um, I'm going to start with being able to advance my slides. There we go. I'm going to start uh, with hybrid learning. This is more of where my research area is, is how to combine those face-to-face -face and online components or those personal and technological components. Um, so I wanted to start there, especially looking forward to when we're actually allowed to see students again and when we can take all of these lessons that we've learned from taking basically crash course and teaching online for the past several months and for the next few months and think about how to combine them with face-to-face -face components and create really quality courses. So there's a lot of different names for hybrid courses. Um, I call them as sort of a broad category mixed instruction courses, meaning that you're getting it from people from technology in face-to-face -face settings, in online settings, all sorts of different things. And so if you are trying to find out more about this area, you might see it called hybrid learning, blended learning, flipped, inverted. Although inverted is really only a term that I see engineering education use for flipped classrooms. Um, so if you're in that space, um, you might see it called inverted supplemental or replacement and so those are if you know that's the big category of what we're talking about for this hybrid section and to skip straight to the punchline what i found through my research is that these sorts of mixed instruction courses have the potential to either improve learning or reduce cost resources whatever you want to call it whether that's time um, time in a classroom, classroom space, that sort of resource. Um, but it also comes with fewer limitations in that people don't need to be in the same space. You know, just like this seminar, we don't, I'm sure, you know, I wouldn't have traveled to London to give this talk. So it provides us, you know, a lot of different options for talking to people, um, different paces for people who have different, you know, restrictions on their time. And a different time, like you get to pick how you spend your time a little bit better. And I wanted to address if you've tried to learn about this area and you've tried to look at what people recommend or whether they say it's effective, you might have found that this area is a bit of a mess, especially over the past 15 years. It's gotten better um, recently. When I really started digging into this like five years ago, there was no consensus whatsoever on whether hybrid instruction was effective, um, whether it saved any time, whether it provided any benefit at all. And basically what I found is that's because people use those terms that I listed on the last slide 
in completely different ways. Um, so what someone calls a hybrid class is not necessarily what someone else would consider a hybrid class, or they call it blended, or they call it flipped. And all of these sorts of different terms made it really difficult to find themes in the research, uh, to have discussions. It used to be that when you'd go and try to have a discussion with someone, you'd have to spend like a paragraph of talking to them, explaining exactly what you mean by blended, and then through the rest of the talk, try to translate what they were saying into what you knew, what your definition of blended was based on their definition. All of this made it really difficult to advance research and practice. So what I did was I uh, went through this research and I tried to identify features of courses that were similar and then look at whether those features affected learning. So I tried to add some meaningful classifications by creating a taxonomy. And the first part of creating this taxonomy was looking at previous definitions that people had um, for hybrid, blended, flipped, all those terms. And the, in those definitions, the dimensions that I identified that were sort of similar between them was delivery medium. So how is delivery be, uh, instruction being delivered, whether it's face-to-face, -face, through an instructor, through technology, instruction type, what sort of instruction is it? Is it sort of the sage on the sage style where you're just sort of like a textbook passing information along? Um, or is it providing feedback while students are applying different uh, techniques to problem solving? And then the last one was synchronicity, whether everyone was together at one time working on something at the same time or whether it was at your own pace, uh, working at different times and having sort of common deadlines, but otherwise working by yourself. And at the time that I created this taxonomy, which was about five years ago, synchronicity was always tied into the delivery medium. So face-to-face -face classes were always considered synchronous and online classes were always considered asynchronous. So that wasn't a definition or a dimension that ended up making it into the taxonomy, but the taxonomy was supposed to be just sort of a base foundation level, and then people could add their own dimensions on top of it to consider um, whether that affected the results. So you can layer synchronicity as a third dimension on top of it, or anything else like peer learning, something like that. So the two dimensions are delivery medium, whether it's delivered from an instructor or whether it's delivered via technology. And delivered from an instructor means in a face-to-face -face setting. So if you're using a uh, PowerPoint or some sort of technology to help you deliver as an instructor, that's still considered delivering via instructor. And then the other side is delivering via technology, and that's to mean online. So if you're you know, recording a lecture that you give in a face-to-face -face setting, but then students are watching it in an online setting, that's delivered via technology. And so, as you can tell, the content doesn't really matter for the delivery medium. It's purely delivery medium. The content, however, does matter for the second dimension, which is instruction type. So on one side, we have receiving content, and this is from the student's perspective. So if the instruction type is receiving content, then the student is sort of being somewhat passive. You know, they can be actively making connections or constructively making connections, but the instructor is giving them content to learn. Or on the other side, they're applying content and receiving feedback as the type of instruction that they're getting. So the applying content is more student driven and the receiving content is more teacher driven of what exactly the content being provided is. So we take both of these uh, dimensions and we sort of make the square to make the taxonomy so that we have these sort of four different quadrants. And 
like Sue said, we are sharing these slides widely, so there's not going to be a test about this. Um, so don't feel like you have to memorize what all these terms are. I'm not sure I could tell you what all the terms are and I made the thing. So um, I just want to point out that there's sort of four general quadrants. One in the top left corner being delivered in a face-to-face -face setting with an instructor and receiving content, so like a face-to-face -face lecture. On the top right corner, it's still delivered face-to-face -face via an instructor, but it's more applied content. So like a lab where you have students working through things and they're asking questions, maybe the instructor gives a five-minute lecture based on a question that they keep hearing from the students that's still student-driven, so that would still be considered feedback while applying content. And then on the bottom of the taxonomy, we have the same thing, but it's now online delivered. So if you have a lecture that you're viewing online, that would be technology transmitted or some sort of application that you're doing mediated by technology is at the bottom right, technology mediated. And so these are, if you were to only do one of these four things, it wouldn't be hybrid or blended, but when you start mixing and matching, that is where you start getting the hybrid. And we called the left area, the lecture hybrid, we called these hybrid because based on previous definitions that they had, when people differentiated between hybrid and blended, a lot of times they use them interchangeably, but when people did differentiate, they meant only one sort of instruction. So if we're doing a lecture hybrid, then we're still only doing delivery or, yeah, delivery of content or receiving content, um, but both face-to-face -face and online or practice hybrid is only giving feedback while applying content, but it's also both face-to-face -face online. And then along the top is face-to-face -face combination. So if you have a class that's both lecture and a lab, for example, that's a combination class for face-to-face -face, and at the bottom is the same but online. So I imagine a lot of us are doing online combinations right now. We want to give our students chances to apply things and get feedback on them, but everything's online. I also want to point out that the taxonomy is only for things that we control as instructors. So we can't control whether students talk to each other, uh, we can't control whether they email us with questions. So this is purely a tool for defining how we design our courses. And I keep hitting my keyboard on my main computer instead of my laptop. That's All right, so, and then in the middle, we have this blended area, which has a significant portion of face-to-face -face and online receiving content and applying content. So it's a little bit of everything. There's specific types of blended. If you've heard of flipped classrooms, this is the traditional, as much as anything's traditional in this space, uh, but this is where you have online lectures that students watch before they come to class, and then they're working on problems while people, or while they're getting feedback from the instructor. So that's a blended. Another common type is a supplemental, where you have a face-to-face -face sort of lecture type class, and then you have uh, online applying content while getting feedback via technology. This is actually really a lot more common in computer science than it is in other sorts of disciplines because you'll have the sort of lecture class and then you actually have the technology via auto graders to provide feedback to students in an online setting. So you actually get the other part of this where you're still getting instruction in the online setting because you have a technology that allows you to do that. And then a replacement blend is not very common, but it's somewhat common. It's basically an online class that had both that lecture and feedback component, and they just replaced part of it with online lecture and online feedback. And so it's not very common, except in, I've seen this in colleges sometimes where they like they just don't have the physical space 
in the classrooms. And so half the class will be assigned to come on Tuesday and half the class will be assigned to come on Thursday and the other class will participate remote, the other half of the class will participate remotely. I should also say that all of these um, concepts apply to both primary and secondary school and university and college. Uh, originally blended and flipped classrooms started coming out of uh, primary and secondary school and they were sort of adopted later by college. So a lot of the research is in both of these spaces. So this is the pretty graphic where you put it all together where I spend way too much time picking colors. Um, but if you want the final product, you know, the slides will be provided. All right, so after I looked through all of these papers and sort of came up with these definitions and these dimensions, what about these classes is actually, actually affects learning? And so here's your obligatory method slide. Um, looked for anything that talked about hybrid, blended, flipped, or inverted for 15 years up until 2015. Um, in education databases, Google Scholar, uh, the normal places you'd look. I only considered papers that talked about quasi-experimental research, and that meant that they had to include a control group that they were comparing to. A lot of times it was the course, the same course just taught in the previous semester. Uh, they had to measure quantitative learning outcomes. It, some of the research in this space does surveys of how students think about uh, the class and a common point from those is that students really don't like hybrid classes the first few weeks because it's not how they've learned to engage in classes, um, especially college students. They've really gotten down how they're going to engage in classes and be successful and then you say, all right, we're going to flip that on its head and we're going to do something totally different and they get a little weirded out for the first few weeks, but then after they see that their tests come back really positive and that they're feeling really engaged in class, they get um, a little bit more enthusiastic about it. So if you are trying something like this, be aware that there's some pushback from students at the beginning. And then the last part of the methods was that we only looked at higher education courses for credit. Uh, a lot of the primary and secondary school uh, research didn't have a control group or it didn't have um, the quantitative learning outcomes. And so there were only a few of those that we could have included. And so we thought it would be cleaner just to include the higher education courses. And ultimately we looked at 49 uh, examples of hybrid or blended classrooms. And the point of this slide is just to illustrate how all over the place this research is in terms of terminology. So uh, these on the bar chart are the courses that I identify as hybrid based on the definition that I just gave you. But in the literature, they were called uh, lecture hybrid, practice hybrid, replacement blend, flip blend, supplemental blend, basically all the categories they were called those things. Um, but based on the reclassification, they're really hybrid courses. The same was true for the blended courses. So regardless of what they were called in the literature, I reclassified them based on this definitions uh, that I had come in so that I could see what exactly about the course was being successful or not. And so here's the graph to actually pay attention to. So on the y-axis we have number of courses, so this is the number of papers um, where, that were in each category. On the x-axis we have the different types. Um, so from left to right, lecture hybrid is only lecture but it's part face-to-face, -face, part online. Practice hybrid is only receiving feedback while applying, part face-to-face, -face, part online. Replacement is where you had the lecture and practice in a face-to-face -face classroom, but then you sort of replaced part of it with online. 
flipped blend is where you had the receiving content in an online setting and then you practiced applying the content in class with feedback from an instructor. And so that's the really interesting one that we're going to dig into because that's the one that really improved learning outcomes. And then the supplemental blend was where you had the face-to-face -face lecture and a online uh, applying content and receiving feedback via online. And actually, so for computer science education, the supplemental blend is a really interesting case because the two that found improved learning outcomes and the two that found equivalent learning outcomes had sort of some themes, I thought, but it's two in each like category, so it's hard to say you can really extrapolate that uh, very far. I'll also point out at this point that there wasn't a single paper I found that learning in a hybrid class diminished learning outcomes. I don't think that's because it doesn't happen. I think that's because the authors wouldn't want to publish that or the journals wouldn't want to publish that. So that's, uh, you know, a part of the data that I think is not represented. All right, so how courses changed. So if you're moving instruction online, the good news for all of us who find that we're having to move instruction online is that if you only change the delivery medium, if you only go from face to face to online, it doesn't really hurt learning. This is supported by the um, media debates that we had in the 90s uh, where they were trying to say whether one medium or another was better or worse. And they basically found as long as it's an appropriate medium for what you're doing, then it's okay. And so that's backed up by this data as well. If you look at how time in class changed, so time in a physical classroom changed, uh, 22 of the 49 studies reduced time in class and most of them had equivalent learning outcomes. 27 maintained time in class and most of those had improved learning outcomes. So that was basically they added an online component to the class but also kept meeting in the face-to-face -face classroom and found that they improved learning outcomes. And a big reason for that was that those 27 added some sort of feedback uh, during content application. So students were practicing applying what they had learned and getting feedback from the instructor as a form of instruction. And so most of the courses that added feedback improved learning outcomes. And if you narrow that down even further to only looking at classrooms where feedback was a new element, so some of them already had part of feedback. If you take those out, then it's almost 90% of adding feedback while students are applying content improves learning outcomes. So that's really the benefit that comes from a flipped classroom is that by having students learn content or sort of receive content in a different setting, you're freeing up time to provide feedback and the feedback that they're getting while they're applying their content is helping them to learn better. The areas of disagreement, and these are based on sort of small numbers, so I want you to take it a little bit with a grain of salt, uh, but a lot of times instructors will say, well, if I assign my students lectures to watch or things to read outside of class, they won't do it. They'll just come to class without doing it and then they won't be able to do the application activities that we've done. And I found in the research that that is true if the instructor breaks and provides a lecture anyway. So if five students come and say, I didn't do the reading, I didn't do the watching, and the instructor says, fine, I'll tell you in 15 minutes what you're supposed to learn. Then they learn, I don't have to do the watching, I don't have to do the reading, they'll tell me what I need to know in 15 minutes. Um, so the instructors that sort of held firm and said, okay, then you're not going to do this application activity, you should go in the back and watch the lectures or something like that. Um, those are the courses that 
found the most improved learning outcomes, the one where the instructor sort of broke down and decided to do the short version of the lecture were those few flipped classrooms that didn't uh, actually improve learning outcomes. The feedback from technology is a really interesting one for computer science education because like I said, those supplemental ones where they were doing some sort of activity online where they were getting feedback, it really, really helped when the activity they were doing was sort of rote. Um, so like when they were in a foreign language class and they were conjugating verbs, there's a right answer and there's a wrong answer and there's not a whole lot of point from a learning perspective to delay feedback in those cases. It's not like you know solving a complex problem where if you just let it sit for a little bit, you might come with a fresh uh, perspective and be able to solve it by yourself. So if you're doing a really rote task, providing immediate feedback from technology like an auto grader in computer science is effective. But if you're doing a more open-ended task, like a design task or uh, working on a paper or something like that, that's where the technology feedback didn't uh, help. It didn't necessarily hurt, but it didn't really help. And that also applies to the last point, which is continuing application activities online had a better uh, percentage of success. And what I mean by that is that if you started an application activity in class, you sort of got students going, you gave them feedback in the early stages, and then they continued that online with only feedback from technology, that improved learning outcomes better than if you just gave them some application activity to do totally online, that they started online and didn't have uh, that face-to-face -face component originally. So here we go to the practical part for the immediate future. What if you can only teach online? And so there's some uh, foundations that I want to start with. And a lot of these, I bet all of you do at least one of these already. Uh, so you want to align your learning objectives, your instruction, your activities, your assessments, and your assignments. And this is something that we as instructors already do. And it's effortful when you're starting a new class, when you're designing a new class or teaching a class for the first time, you have to go through this process of what am I trying to teach? How am I going to get there? So when you have to move online to a new medium, it just takes that effort of remembering to align these things. And so whenever students will ask me questions in like a new class or especially a newly online class, you know, do I have to do this this way or is it fine to do it this other way that's sort of easier for me? I'll just think, does that still meet the objective? Does it still provide, you know, opportunities for assessment? And uh, I'll use that to guide my response. Use good equipment. Uh, Diana and uh, Sue sent me a list before this that had the same, uh, the same recommendation was use headphones. Um, otherwise, there can be an echo. And use a good microphone. Uh, so if you're using your laptop microphone, it's like it's okay for you know weekly meetings or something like that. But especially if you're in a college class where you're going to be talking for maybe two hours a week, um, the quality just it makes it a little bit harder to understand. And so it's sort of like reading in cursive versus reading in print. You can do it, but it's going to be just that much easier if you have good equipment for the audio. Be consistent in disseminating information. So normally when we disseminate information in person, there's that five minutes of students asking questions. Usually that's written exactly on the thing that you gave them. When's it due? What format do you want it in? It's harder to ask those sorts of questions, so just be very consistent about where they can find that information. That'll help. Also highlight important points verbally and visually. So there's a lot of nonverbal that goes into our communication when we're talking face to face, and we just have to be a little bit more pointed about that in online settings. So if you're doing like a slide 
highlight something or put it in bold, um, don't assume that students will be able to pick up on it like they would in class. The second of, I believe it's three slides that I have about this is promoting social learning. Um, so learning is a social thing, or at least it happens better when it's a social thing. Um, so I don't have a webcam at home, but I wanted to make sure I got my laptop out for this so I would have a webcam for this talk just because there is that social component of if you can see me, then you sort of feel obligated to listen to me a little bit more, you know, especially like if I look directly into uh, the webcam, it sort of mimics that eye contact. You feel a little bit more guilty about checking your email or something like that. Um, so it's the same thing for students. Um, so use video, especially if you're talking one-on-one -on -one with a student or if you're talking for an extended time uh, in like a lecture. Also create ways for students to talk to each other. So you can make discussions in whatever learning management system you have. You don't necessarily need to require responses, um, but just something that lets them know someone's out there and that they're thinking about these things too, and that if they wanted to ask a question or see someone else's perspective, that that's available. It can be very isolating to learn in an online setting. If you can, provide them a way to talk to each other through some sort of medium that you don't have access to. So like encourage them to make a you know, group in some sort of social media that they like. Um, we have a specific thing at my university that is for students to get together around a course. And I know it's really uncomfortable to intentionally provide a space for students to sort of talk behind your back. Um, but it's really important because they do that anyway. And they're going to talk differently if they think you're looking over their shoulder, even if you're not. So make sure, or if you can, give them something where that you can't look over their shoulder. Provide feedback on assignments um, or create ways for students to provide feedback on each other's assignments or get help during assignments. So uh, if I'm doing an online class, specifically if it's for students who aren't used to online learning, I'll give them multiple stages of a project where I might not normally in a face-to-face -face class so that they can see what each other are working on. Just because it's harder to make that connection of you know, the five minutes before class, oh, what are you doing for this project sort of thing. Also breakout rooms. If you have a large class, providing breakout rooms for small group work is, I found so helpful. Because my online classes, they're only 20 students or maybe 15 students, but they really don't like to talk uh, if we're all in one group together. Just because, you know, it's that sort of talk tag thing where, you start saying something and someone else is saying something and there's no nonverbal cues of who's going to say something. But if I put them in groups of three to four, they'll just talk nonstop and it's great. Course design. If students have never met in person, provide them that sort of icebreaker activity that you might do if they were meeting in person, just so they can learn a little bit about each other as people rather than as, you know, an anonymous voice on online. If students are new to online learning, uh, give them short and frequent assignments. This is a good way to keep track with them since you're not seeing them. It can be really easy to lose track of a student if you don't see them every day or every class. So frequent assignments, I'll usually do for new students who are new to online learning a weekly assignment that's just short um, that keeps them on track and make sure they're not getting behind and then provide quick feedback on those assignments even if it's just good job it lets them know that you are engaging with them um, the the social presence in online learning is larger so if you can create more of that i'm not sure exactly what i said but um the instructor presence, if you're providing frequent feedback to them, is stronger so that they feel more part of a learning community. And then try different media. Um, students are really 
I found open to trying new things and seeing how it goes, especially if you explain, I want to try this because I think it'll be good for this thing, then they'll sort of suspend their disbelief or go along with it longer than you know they might otherwise. So there's more options available than face-to-face. -face. You can try different video options, different audio options, you know, recording beforehand, doing synchronous, all sorts of, I'll often use like videos from YouTube if I don't feel like I can explain it any better than something, you know, that someone that put a time into producing like an animation, then I'll just use those. Um, so yeah, try different stuff. I feel like oh, we're all cutting each other a lot of slack right now. So uh, don't be shy. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we should all, how can we do a round of applause when we're all on mute? We just do our jazz hands or whatever um, to say thank you to Lauren. Um, that's um, brilliant. Okay, so um, I really wanted Lauren for everybody to have some small group ch chat bit, bit, um, at this point. So um, Diana is going to wave her magic wand and put us into um, breakout groups for uh, maybe eight to ten minutes, something like that. Um, and uh, and then we'll come back. And so your task when you're in your breakout groups is in your group to come up with one really good question that in from your group that you'd like to ask. Um, Lauren um, about her talk so that would that that would be great and to help you with that I don't know if you know that um, Zoom, um, Zoom yes Zoom we're in Zoom I'm so many tools um, we're in Zoom today um, has a, a whiteboard function so if you go I didn't know this before if you go to your share screen button in your little groups you can have a whiteboard so in your little groups you can use this whiteboard to sort of sketch out the you know killer question or the the um, additional information question or whatever it is clarification question that you want to ask um, Lauren and um, and then Diana will bring us back and then we'll have an opportunity for a whole group discussion. There are now about there were seventy eight people on the call. Now we've lost what, nearly seventy, so there's um, lots of people to ask you questions. So um, Diana, are you ready to press the button? Okay, thank you. Anyway, welcome back everybody. I've got a different set of people to look at now, which is um, very nice. And 60 people still here. That's that's fantastic. Um, so, uh, right. So I, I am. Um, did anyone use the whiteboard function to start of interest? Yeah, Josh? Uh, yeah, 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 we did. Yeah, very good. Okay, so I'm going to ask for um, volunteers, whoever the spokesperson in their group is. Um, could you, there's a little thing called a reaction thing down the bottom. Can you wave your hand? Um, at, oh no, is it a clap? Whatever it is, one of those thumbs up or clap things. Just wave one of those yellow buttons, um, um, and then I'll go come to you, and you can ask a question. Um, and I can see Oliver's uh, was first, so I'll start with Oliver for first question. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in first. So I was kind of testing, but I do have a question that a lot of what we talked about in our group really centered around inclusion. Um, inclusion in terms of um, young people who might have special educational needs um, but also children who and it's maybe a, a separate side of the question children who might be di digitally disadvantaged so at the moment in Scotland um, seeing about 20 percent of young people not really able to engage with with school at the moment because of lack of technology um, and and also sort of different age groups so we, we're thinking about what are the what are the things that you would need to shift and change in order to address children of different ages or children with different special educational needs and and how how about digitally disadvantaged um so that's a great question and it's not one that the research i've read really addresses uh most of what i've read is secondary primarily um in college age secondary primarily that hope makes sense. <laughs> um, I know that something that they've done over here in my state is um, they've sort of adjusted how long each person has on specifically talking about online learning while we're still completely online. How long 
each grade level spends in a structured environment. Um, and I've seen this research for the like online classes too, that you should only make, I'm going to forget what the rule of thumb is, um, but you should, if you're recording video lectures, you should only make them, it's like the grade level times 0.5. So if you're, or the age level times 0.5. So if you're talking to six year olds, then you should only make three minute videos. And if you're talking to 10 year olds and you should only make five minute videos just because, you know, that's how the attention span develops over time. Um, so that sort of talks to the age portion of what you're talking about. For the special education portion, I'm not sure I can make any recommendations and I'm, you know, that's the nature of special education. Um, I've seen some really great examples of how teachers especially in like in the United States, we have large rural areas and don't necessarily have great internet connection. And so I've seen some really great examples of how teachers deal with that in terms of like pre-recording things and sending them on disks to their student or sending them home with disks um, that they can play more easily without a great internet connection. But I'm not sure I can provide like a overall recommendation that's gonna make sense for everybody. Okay, great. I think there were quite a few other questions. So, um, James, did you, James, in the my top right hand corner, you were waving. Did you have a question? You were discussing feedback, uh, and you said that uh, feedback for the rote learning style questions was really useful, but for the open ended style questions was less useful. Um, I work for a physics and computer science education platform where we we have sort of mathematical questions that are sort of somewhere between open-ended. They've got a right answer. Is there any research on whether the feedback for that is as good as the rote questions or? And the research on that part was a little bit more scarce. And so there's a really stark difference between one of them was conjugating verbs in a foreign language class. And one of them was writing papers. And so, you know, that's the total opposite ends of the spectrum. And I know in computer science education, there are some really rote things, especially for programming. When you're first starting to learn programming, there's pretty much one right answer. But once you start developing something a little bit more complicated, it can be in the middle. Um, and so using tools like debuggers or um, something like that to help with that aspect, I think would be really useful. But in terms of the overall design of like a program or a system, that might be something that you want to start in a classroom while you have an instructor provide more personalized feedback. And then as they're building out the details of it, uh, auto grader, or a compiler or something like that would be a good technology tool. Okay, thank you. I've got, um... Um, some more questions coming in the chat as well. Jane, do you want to ask your question or do we need to read it out? Um, I'll, I'll say it. So we were in room five and we had a similar question to Oliver, but it was a little more specific. And it was around your own research and looking at all those studies. Did anything kind of come out around the differences between certain groups of children, ethnic minority groups? The reason I ask is that the Open University had a big study recently and seemed to suggest that certain ethnic groups uh, made less progress online with them with face to face. And I wondered if you'd seen a similar kind of pattern or not. I don't remember. I don't think any of the papers specifically looked at that. Um, they were usually single classrooms within a school and so within a certain school it was a little bit more homogenous than something like you know open university would uh, be considering um, a few of them did consider personality traits so they looked at people who were more extroverted and more introverted and they found that the asynchronous online helped those students who would normally not feel comfortable speaking out in class to have a bit more presence in the conversation um, but that's sort of the only thing that I remember. Okay. Um, I'm conscious there are quite a lot of questions, but I don't remember where they are. So can you wave your yellow hands, everybody who's got another question, please? Oh, Emma, 
Emma's the first one that popped up for me. Emma, do you've got a question for Hi, Yes, thanks. Um, so in our group, we had various discussions, but one was particularly for Lauren on what, is there anything that you, you are specifically doing online which you didn't do before lockdown? Is there a particular method that's come to the fore as really effective in this space? So pre-lockdown, I tend to be pretty rigid um, in my online classes. I say, here's the deadline. It's completely flexible if you talk to me before the deadline, but if you submit it after the deadline, you know, don't talk to me, there's nothing I can do. And I you know, stick pretty rigidly to that. Afterwards, it's not my approach at all. I've had way more one-on-one -on -one conversations with students, you know, they're dealing with a lot in their lives. And so I've basically said, I can work with you on anything, um, but here's the hard deadline of when I have to submit grades. So um, I'll just, you know, they have their assignments rolling in as normal. If one isn't there, I'll just reach out to them and say, hey, what, you know, what's the timeline that you predict on this? So that's the main difference for me. And the flexibility, has that been quite stressful? for you um i'm fortunate that i don't have that many students this semester um but honestly being really rigid like for me <laughs> is stressful just because i hate having to sort of put that hammer down um so actually honestly i think it's a little bit less stressful <laughs> for me <laughs> even okay. though i think it's what's better which is why i do it but right Thank you. Um, and Diane, you've, you've got a question. I'm coming to you now. You keep waving your yellow hand. Yeah, I know, I'm not quite, it disappears every so often, so I'm not <laughs> sure if it stays there or not. Yeah, our group was interested on something Oliver touched on earlier, actually, in his question, which was about um, access to technology, because we had someone in our group who was actually teaching at a university, and he said when they, did the, when they closed down, they found that 350 students didn't have laptops at all, and 10 computer science students didn't have laptops. And I just wonder, you know, what the techniques or tips are for dealing with situations like that. And our university deals with that a lot. We have a lot of first generation students, a lot of students from, um, you know, low income families. And fortunately, the university as a whole came out with a strategy for that. Um, so like our library has laptops that students can normally rent out for a limited period of time and they've let them take that more, um, more liberally. And um, we also didn't shut down our dorms if students needed to stay. So, and a lot of students chose to stay just so that they would have the Wi-Fi access that they have on campus. Um, so in terms of like a general recommendation, it's, I was really appreciative of the system support that we got for that. I'm not sure how I would deal with it on an individual level, but um, a lot of students, even if they don't have laptops, do have phones. And there are um, specific techniques for designing for phones um, that I didn't touch on, but there's, um, lots of resources available for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Lauren, I've realized it's gone after six. Well, not six, what, what, what is it time? Is it with you, one o'clock? Yeah, or whatever time, translate into your own time, everybody. Um, it's gone over that hour, so I think we should probably start wrapping up. But it's really interesting that there are a lot of questions about inclusion, there's more come up the chat about digital divide, access to technology. When Laura and I were in our little mini breakout group, we were talking about teachers who are terrified of using the technology, you know, who, who themselves very anxious about the technology. So I think that's something that we all probably um, all want to think about. But it's great that you've shared with us these studies and they're all, you know, the, the higher education studies. I really hope that we get to see more studies about hybrid and online learning in primary and secondary schools. Do you mean, because, because what's what we're getting used to as a new normal um you know maybe going on for us for quite a little you know a little while in various forms um so thank you everybody um so much for your participation particularly thank you to um lauren 
for your um for your help can we all jazz hands again for to say thank you to lauren i don't know what the protocol is for this but waving your arms around seems to be a thing that people sometimes do to say thank you um and uh diana's just put up a, this the slide so we've got a little this is we've got a little feedback form if you want to, if you want to fill it in we've also got a link there to our seminar page where we've got other seminars that you can join um and we've also got a uh, a form when you can sign up for our newsletter which is where we'll be sharing with you any other activities that we're doing around research in two weeks time we'll meet again and we've got um um Juan David Rodriguez joining us from Madrid, who's talking about um, teaching um, AI at school, which I'm sure is a completely different topic. We've got some different topics coming up, so that may be um, of interest to some of you. Um, but until then, I can see lots of chats, messages coming up to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Lauren. Um, thank you very much for coming and um, sharing that with us. And we will be following up with sharing Lauren's slides, sharing the video. And Laura and I are going to write a blog post to, to summarise what we've been talking about today. So um, that's all for now. Thank you for joining us and enjoy your lunch, dinner or whatever you're moving on to, whatever time of day it is next. Thank you very much.